Section 1 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott, 1754-1829. Section 1. The story of Beder, Prince of Persia, and Jehanara, Princess of Samandal, or Samander. Part 1. Persia was an empire of such vast extent that its ancient monarchs, not without reason, assumed the haughty title of King of Kings. For not to mention those subdued by their arms, there were kingdoms and provinces whose kings were not only tributary, but also in as great subjection as governors in other nations are to the monarchs. One of these kings, who in the beginning of his reign had signalized himself by many glorious and successful conquests, enjoyed so profound a peace and tranquillity as rendered him the happiest of princes. The only point in which he thought himself unfortunate was that amongst all his wives not one had brought him a son, and being now far advanced in years, he was desirous of an heir. He had above a hundred ladies, all lodged in separate apartments, with women slaves to wait upon, and eunuchs to guard them. Yet notwithstanding all his endeavours to please their taste and anticipate their wishes, there was not one that answered his expectation. He had women frequently brought him from the most remote countries, and if they pleased him, he not only gave the merchants their full price, but loaded them with honours and benedictions, in hopes that at last he might be so happy as to meet with one by whom he might have a son. There was scarcely an act of charity but he performed, to prevail with heaven. He gave immense sums to the poor, besides large donations to the religious, building for their use many noble colleges, richly endowed in hopes of obtaining by their prayers what he so earnestly desired. One day, according to the custom of his royal predecessors, during their residence in their capital, he held an assembly of his courtiers, at which all the ambassadors and strangers of quality about the court were present, and where they not only entertained one another with news and politics, but also by conversing on the sciences, history, poetry, literature, and whatever else was capable of diverting the mind. On that day a eunuch came to acquaint him with the arrival of a certain merchant from a distant country, who, having brought a slave with him, desired leave to show her to his majesty. "'Give him admittance instantly,' said the king, "'and after the assembly is over I will talk with him.' The merchant was introduced, and seated in a convenient place, from whence he might easily have a full view of the king, and hear him talk familiarly to those that stood near his person. The king observed this rule to all strangers, in order that by degrees they might grow acquainted with him, so that when they saw with what freedom and civility he addressed himself to all, they might be encouraged to talk to him in the same manner, without being abashed at the pomp and splendour of his appearance which was enough to deprive those of their power of speech who were not used to it. He treated the ambassadors also after the same manner. He ate with them, and during the repast asked them several questions concerning their health, their journey, and the peculiarities of their country. After they had been thus encouraged, he gave them audience. When the assembly was over, and all the company had retired, the merchant, who was the only person left, fell prostrate before the king's throne, with his face to the earth, wishing his majesty an accomplishment of all his desires. As soon as he arose, the king asked him if the report of his having brought a slave for him was true, and whether she were handsome. Sire, replied the merchant, I doubt not but your majesty has many very beautiful women, since you search every corner of the earth for them but I may boldly affirm, without overvaluing my merchandise, 
that you never yet saw a woman that could stand in competition with her for shape and beauty agreeable qualifications and all the perfections that she is mistress of where is she demanded the king bring her to me instantly sire replied the merchant i have delivered her into the hands of one of your chief eunuchs and your majesty may send for her at your pleasure the fair slave was immediately brought in and no sooner had the king cast his eyes on her but he was charmed with her beautiful and easy shape he went directly into a closet and was followed by the merchant and a few eunuchs the fair slave wore over her face a red satin veil striped with gold and when the merchant had taken it off the king of persia beheld a female that surpassed in beauty not only his present ladies but all that he had ever had before he immediately fell passionately in love with her and desired the merchant to name his price sire said he i gave a thousand pieces of gold to the person of whom i bought her and in my three years journey to your court i reckon i have spent as much more but i shall forbear setting any price to so great a monarch and therefore if your majesty likes her i humbly beg you would accept of her as a present i am highly obliged to you replied the king but it is never my custom to treat merchants who come hither for my pleasure in so ungenerous a manner i am going to order thee ten thousand pieces of gold will that be sufficient sire answered the merchant i should have esteemed myself happy in your majesty's acceptance of her yet i dare not refuse so generous an offer i will not fail to publish your liberality in my own country and in every place through which i may pass the money was paid and before he departed the king made him put on a rich suit of cloth of gold the king caused the fair slave to be lodged in the apartment next his own and gave particular orders to the matrons and the female slaves appointed to attend her that after bathing they should dress her in the richest habit they could find and carry her the finest pearl necklaces the brightest diamonds and other richest precious stones that she might choose those she liked best the officious matrons whose only care was to please the king were astonished at her beauty and being good judges they told his majesty that if he would allow them but three days they would engage to make her so much handsomer than she was at present that he would scarcely know her again the king could hardly prevail with himself to delay so long the pleasure of seeing her but at last he consented the king of persia's capital was situated in an island and his palace which was very magnificent was built on the shore his apartment looked on the water the fair slaves which was near it had also the same prospect and was the more agreeable on account of the seas beating almost against the walls at the three days end the fair slave magnificently dressed was alone in her chamber sitting on a sofa and leaning against one of the windows that faced the sea when the king being informed that he might visit her came in the slave hearing somebody walk in the room with an air quite different from that of the female slaves who had hitherto attended her immediately turned her head about to see who it was she knew him to be the king but without discovering the least surprise or so much as rising from her seat to salute or receive him as if he had been the most indifferent person in the world she put herself in the same posture again the king of persia was extremely surprised to see a slave of so beauteous a form so ignorant of the world he attributed this to the narrowness of her education and the little care that had been taken to instruct her in the first rules of civility he went to her at the window where notwithstanding the coldness and indifference with which she had received him she suffered herself to be admired caressed and embraced as much as he pleased in the midst of these amorous embraces and tender endearments the king paused a while to gaze upon or rather to devour her with his eyes my lovely fair one my charmer exclaimed he whence came you 
and where do those happy parents live who brought into the world so surprising a masterpiece of nature how do i love thee and shall always continue to do never did i feel for a woman what i now feel for you and though i have seen and every day behold a vast number of beauties yet never did my eyes contemplate so many charms in one person charms which have so transported me that i shall entirely devote myself to you my dearest life continued he you neither answer nor by any visible token give me the least reason to believe that you are sensible of the demonstrations i have given you of the ardour of my passion neither will you turn your eyes on me to afford mine the pleasure of meeting them and to convince you that it is impossible to love in a higher degree than i do you why will you still preserve this obstinate silence which chills me and whence proceeds the seriousness or rather sorrow that torments me to the soul do you mourn for your country your friends or your relations alas is not the king of persia who loves and adores you capable of comforting you and making you amends for every loss notwithstanding all the protestations of love the king of persia made the fair slave and all he could say to induce her to speak to him she remained unaltered and keeping her eyes still fixed upon the ground would neither look at him nor utter a word the king of persia delighted with the purchase he had made of a slave that pleased him so well pressed her no farther in hopes that by treating her kindly he might prevail upon her to change her behaviour he clapped his hands and the women who waited in an outward room entered he commanded them to bring in supper when it was arranged my love said he to the slave come hither and sup with me she rose from her seat and being seated opposite the king his majesty helped her before he began eating himself and did so of every dish during supper the slave ate as well as the king but still with downcast eyes and without speaking a word though he often asked her how she liked the entertainment and whether it was dressed according to her taste the king willing to change the conversation asked her what her name was how she liked the clothes and the jewels she had on what she thought of her apartment and the rich furniture and whether the prospect of the sea was not very agreeable but to all these questions she made no reply so that the king was at a loss what to think of her silence he imagined at first that she might perhaps be dumb but then said he to himself can it be possible that heaven should forge a creature so beautiful so perfect and so accomplished and at the same time with so great an imperfection were it however so i could not love her with less passion than i do when the king of persia rose he washed his hands on one side while the fair slave washed hers on the other he took that opportunity to ask the woman who held the basin and napkin if ever they had heard her speak one of them replied sire we have neither seen her open her lips nor heard her speak any more than your majesty has we have rendered her our services in the bath we have dressed her head put on her clothes and waited upon her in her chamber but she has never opened her lips so much as to say that is well or i like this we have often asked her madam do you want anything is there anything you wish for do but ask and command us but we have never been able to draw a word from her we cannot tell whether her sorrow proceeds from pride sorrow stupidity or dumbness the king was more astonished at hearing this than he had been before however believing the slave might have some cause of sorrow he was willing to endeavour to divert and amuse her accordingly he appointed a very splendid assembly which all the ladies of the court attended and those who were skilful in playing upon musical instruments performed their parts while others sung or danced or did both together they played at all sorts of games which much diverted the king 
the fair slave was the only person who took no pleasure in these attempts to amuse her she never moved from her place but remained with her eyes fixed on the ground with so much indifference that all the ladies were not less surprised than the king after the assembly was over every one retired to her apartment and the king was left alone with the fair slave the next morning the king of persia rose more pleased than he had been with all the women he had seen before and more enamoured with the fair slave than ever indeed he soon made it appear by resolving henceforth to attach himself to her alone and performed his resolution on the same day he dismissed all his other women giving every one of them their jewels and other valuables besides a considerable fortune with free leave to marry whom they thought fit and only kept the matrons and a few other elderly women to wait upon the fair slave however for a whole year together she never afforded him the pleasure of one single word yet the king continued his assiduities to please her and to give her the most signal proofs of sincere love after the expiration of the year the king sitting one day by his mistress protested to her that his love instead of being diminished grew every day more violent my queen said he i cannot divine what your thoughts are but nothing is more true and i swear to you that having the happiness of possessing you there remains nothing for me to desire i esteem my kingdom great as it is less than an atom when i have the pleasure of beholding you and of telling you a thousand times that i adore you i desire not that my words alone should oblige you to believe me surely you can no longer doubt of my devotion to you after the sacrifice which i have made to your beauty of so many women whom i before kept in my palace you may remember it is about a year since i sent them all away and i as little repent of it now as i did the moment of their departure and i shall never repent nothing would be wanting to complete my happiness and crown my joy would you but speak one single word to me by which i might be assured that you thought yourself at all obliged but how can you speak to me if you are dumb and alas i feel but too apprehensive that this is the case how can i doubt since you still torment me with silence after having for a whole year in vain supplicated you to speak if it is possible for me to obtain of you that consolation may heaven at least grant me the blessing of a son by you to succeed me i every day find myself growing old and i begin already to want one to assist me in bearing the weight of my crown still i cannot conceal the desire i have of hearing you speak for something within me tells me you are not dumb and i beseech i conjure you dear madam to break through this long silence and speak but one word to me after that i care not how soon i die at this discourse the fair slave who according to her usual custom had hearkened to the king with downcast eyes and had given him cause to believe not only that she was dumb but that she had never laughed began to smile the king of persia perceived it with a surprise that made him break forth into an exclamation of joy and no longer doubting but that she was going to speak he waited for that happy moment with an eagerness and attention that cannot easily be expressed at last the fair slave thus addressed herself to the king sire i have so many things to say to your majesty that having once broken silence i know not where to begin however in the first place i think myself bound to thank you for all the favours and honours you have been pleased to confer upon me and to implore heaven to bless and prosper you to prevent the wicked designs of your enemies and not suffer you to die after hearing me speak but to grant you a long life after this sire i cannot give you greater satisfaction than by acquainting you that i am with child and i wish as you do it may be a son 
had it never been my fortune to be pregnant i was resolved i beg your majesty to pardon the sincerity of my intention never to have loved you and to have kept an eternal silence but now i love you as i ought to do the king of persia ravished to hear the fair slave not only speak but tell him tidings in which he was so nearly concerned embraced her tenderly staining light of my eyes said he it is impossible for me to receive greater delight than you have now given me you have spoken to me and you have declared your being with child which i did not expect after these two occasions of joy i am transported out of myself the king of persia in the transport of his feelings said no more to the fair slave he left her but in such a manner as made her perceive his intention was speedily to return and being willing that the occasion of his joys should be made public he declared it to his officers and sent for the grand vizier as soon as he came he ordered him to distribute a thousand pieces of gold among the holy men of his religion who made vows of poverty as also among the hospitals and the poor by way of returning thanks to heaven and his will was obeyed by the direction of that minister after the king of persia had given this order he returned to the fair slave again madam said he pardon me for leaving you so abruptly since you have been the occasion of it but i hope you will indulge me with some conversation since i am desirous to know of you several things of much greater consequence tell me my dearest soul what were the powerful reasons that induced you to persist in that obstinate silence for a whole year together though every day you saw me heard me talk to you ate and drank with me and every night slept with me i shall pass by your not speaking but how you could carry yourself so as that i could never discover whether you were sensible of what i said to you or no i confess surpasses my understanding and i cannot yet comprehend how you could contain yourself so long therefore i must conclude the occasion of it to be very extraordinary to satisfy the king of persia's curiosity replied the lady think whether or no to be a slave far from my own country without any hopes of ever seeing it again to have a heart torn with grief at being separated for ever from my mother my brother my friends and my acquaintance are not these sufficient reasons for the silence your majesty has thought so strange and unaccountable the love of our native country is as natural to us as that of our parents and the loss of liberty is insupportable to every one who is not wholly destitute of common sense and knows how to set a value on it the body indeed may be enslaved and under the subjection of a master who has the power and authority in his hands the will can never be conquered but remains free and unconfined depending on itself alone as your majesty has found in my case and it is a wonder that i have not followed the example of many unfortunate wretches whom the loss of liberty has reduced to the melancholy resolution of procuring their own deaths in a thousand ways by a liberty which cannot be taken from them madam replied the king i am convinced of the truth of what you say but till this moment i was of opinion that a person beautiful of good understanding like yourself whom her evil destiny had condemned to be a slave ought to think herself very happy in meeting with a king for her master sire replied the lady whatever the slave be as i have already observed to your majesty there is no king on earth can tyrannize over her will when indeed you speak of a slave mistress of charms sufficient to captivate a monarch and induce him to love her if she be of a rank infinitely below him I am of your opinion she ought to think herself happy in her misfortunes. Still, what happiness can it be when she considers herself only as a slave, torn from a parent's arms, and perhaps from those of a lover? 
her passion for whom death only can extinguish but when this very slave is in nothing inferior to the king who has purchased her your majesty shall judge yourself of the rigour of her destiny her misery and her sorrow and to what desperate attempts the anguish of despair may drive her the king of persia astonished at this discourse madam said he can it be possible that you are of royal blood as by your words you seem to intimate explain the whole secret to me i beseech you and no longer augment my impatience let me instantly know who are the happy parents of so great a prodigy of beauty who are your brothers your sisters and your relations but above all tell me your name sire said the fair slave my name is gulnar of the sea and my father who is dead was one of the most potent monarchs of the ocean when he died he left his kingdom to a brother of mine named salah and to the queen my mother who is also a princess the daughter of another puissant monarch of the sea we enjoyed profound peace and tranquillity through the whole kingdom till a neighbouring prince envious of our happiness invaded our dominions with a mighty army and penetrating as far as our capital made himself master of it and we had but just time to save ourselves in an impenetrable and inaccessible place with a few trusty officers who did not forsake us in our distress in this retreat my brother was not negligent in contriving means to drive the unjust invaders from our dominions one day taking me into his closet sister said he the events of the smallest undertakings are always dubious for my own part i may fail in the attempt i design to make to recover my kingdom and i shall be less concerned for my own disgrace than what may possibly happen to you to secure you from all accident i would fain see you married but in the present miserable condition of our affairs i see no probability of matching you to any of the princes of the sea and therefore i should be glad if you would concur in my opinion and think of marrying one of the princes of the earth i am ready to contribute all that lies in my power towards accomplishing this and am certain there is not one of them however powerful but considering your beauty would be proud of sharing his crown with you at this discourse of my brother's i fell into a violent passion brother said i you know that i am descended as well as you from the kings and queens of the sea without any mixture of alliance with those of the earth therefore i do not design to marry below myself and i have taken an oath to that effect the condition to which we are reduced shall never oblige me to alter my resolution and if you perish in the execution of your design i am prepared to fall with you rather than follow the advice i so little expected from you my brother who was still earnest for my marriage however improper for me endeavoured to make me believe that there were kings of the earth who were no ways inferior to those of the sea this put me into a more violent passion which occasioned him to say several bitter reflecting things that nettled me to the quick he left me as much dissatisfied with myself as he could possibly be with me and in this peevish mood i gave a spring from the bottom of the sea up to the island of the moon notwithstanding the violent discontent that made me cast myself upon that island i lived content in retirement but in spite of all my precautions a person of distinction attended by his servants surprised me sleeping and carried me to his own house he expressed much love to me and omitted nothing which he thought might induce me to return his passion when he saw that fair means would not prevail upon me he attempted to use force but i soon made him repent of his insolence he resolved to sell me which he did to the merchant who brought me hither and sold me to your majesty he was a prudent courteous humane man and during the whole of the long journey 
never gave me the least reason to complain. As for your majesty, continued the princess Gulnar, if you had not shown me all the respect you have hitherto done, for which I am extremely obliged to your goodness, and given me such undeniable marks of your affection, that I can no longer doubt of it, if you had not immediately sent away your women, I hesitate not to tell you that I should not have remained with you. I would have thrown myself into the sea out of this window, where you accosted me when you first came into this apartment, and have gone in search of my mother, my brother, and the rest of my relations. I should have persisted in that design, and would have put it in execution, if after a certain time I had found myself deceived in the hopes of being with child. But in the condition I am in, all I could say to my mother or my brother would never convince them that I have been a slave to a king like your majesty. They would never believe it, but would for ever upbraid me with the crime I have voluntarily committed against my honour. However, sire, be it a prince or princess that I may bring into the world, it will be a pledge to engage me never to be parted from your majesty, and therefore I hope you will no longer regard me as a slave, but as a princess, worthy your alliance. In this manner the princess Gulnar discovered herself to the king of Persia, and finished her story. "'My charming, my adorable princess!' cried he. "'What wonders have I heard, and what ample matter for my curiosity, to ask a thousand questions concerning those strange and unheard-of things which you have related. But first I ought to thank you for your goodness and patience in making trial of the truth and constancy of my passion. I thought it impossible for me to love you more than I did, but since I know you to be a princess, I love you a thousand times more. Princess, did I say, madam? You are no longer so, but you are my queen, the queen of Persia and by that title you shall soon be proclaimed throughout the whole kingdom. Tomorrow the ceremony shall be performed in my capital, with a pomp and magnificent never yet beheld, which will plainly show that you are my queen and my lawful wife. This should long ago have been done, had you sooner convinced me of my error. For from the first moment of my seeing you, I have been of the same opinion as now, to love you always, and never to place my affections on any other. But that I may satisfy myself, and pay you all the respect that is your due, I beseech you, madam, to inform me more particularly of the kingdom and people of the sea, who are altogether unknown to me. I have heard much talk, indeed, of the inhabitants of the sea, but I always looked upon such accounts merely as tales or fables. By what you have told me, I am convinced there is nothing more true, and I have a proof of it in your own person, who are one of them, and are pleased to condescend to be my wife, which is an honour no other inhabitant on the earth can boast. There is one point, however, which yet perplexes me. Therefore I must beg the favour of you to explain it. That is, I cannot comprehend how it is possible for you to live or move in water without being drowned. There are few amongst us who have the art of staying under water, and they would surely perish if, after a certain time, according to their activity and strength, they did not come up again. Sire, replied the Queen Gulnar, I shall with pleasure satisfy the King of Persia. We can walk at the bottom of the sea with as much ease as you can upon land, and we can breathe in the water as you do in the air, so that instead of suffocating us as it does you, it absolutely contributes to the preservation of our lives. What is yet more remarkable is that it never wets our clothes, so that when we wish to visit the earth, we have no occasion to dry them. Our language is the same with that of the writing engraved upon the seal of the great prophet Solomon, the son of David. I must not forget to inform you further that the water does not in the least hinder us from seeing, 
for we can open our eyes without any inconvenience, and as we have quick piercing sight, we can discern any objects as clearly in the deepest part of the sea as upon land. We have also there a succession of day and night, the moon affords us her light, and even the planets and the stars appear visible to us. I have already spoken of our kingdoms, but as the sea is much more spacious than the earth, so there are a great number of them, and of great extent. They are divided into provinces, and in each province are several great cities, well peopled. In short, there is an infinite number of nations, differing in manners and customs, as they do on the earth. The palaces of the kings and princes are sumptuous and magnificent. Some of them are constructed of marble of various colours, others of rock crystal, with which the sea abounds, mother of pearl, coral, and of other materials more valuable. Gold, silver, and all sorts of precious stones are more plentiful there than on earth. I say nothing of the pearls, since the largest that ever were seen upon earth would not be valued amongst us, and none but the very lowest rank of citizens would wear them. As we have a marvellous and incredible agility to transport ourselves whither we please in the twinkling of an eye, we have no occasion for carriages or horses, not but the king has his stables and his stud of sea-horses, but they are seldom used, except upon public feasts or rejoicing days. Some, after they have trained them, take delight in riding and showing their skill and dexterity in races. Others put them to chariots of mother-of-pearl, adorned with an infinite number of shells of all sorts, of the liveliest colours. These chariots are open, and in the middle is a throne on which the king sits, and shows himself to the public view of his subjects. The horses are trained to draw by themselves, so that there is no occasion for a charioteer to guide them. I pass over a thousand other curious particulars relating to these submarine countries, which would be very entertaining to your majesty, but you must permit me to defer them to a future opportunity, to speak of something of much greater consequence, which is that the method of delivering and the way of managing the women of the sea in their lying in is very different from those of the women of the earth, and I am afraid to trust myself in the hands of the midwives of this country. Therefore, since my safe delivery equally concerns us both, with your majesty's permission, I think it proper for greater security to send for my mother and my cousins to assist at my labour, at the same time to desire the king my brother's company, to whom I have a great desire to be reconciled. They will be glad to see me again, when they understand I am wife to the mighty king of Persia. I beseech your majesty to give me leave to send for them. I am sure they will be happy to pay their respects to you, and I venture to say you will be pleased to see them. Madam, replied the king of Persia, you are mistress, do whatever you please. I will endeavour to receive them with all the honours they deserve. But I would fain know how you will acquaint them with what you desire, and when they will arrive, that I may give orders to make preparation for their reception, and go myself in person to meet them. Sire, replied the Queen Gilnar, there is no need of these ceremonies. They will be here in a moment, and if your majesty will but step into the closet, and look through the lattice, you shall see the manner of their arrival. End of section 1 Section 2 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3 Translated by Jonathan Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gillian Hendry The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3 Translated by Jonathan Scott, 1754-1829 to 1829. Section 2 The Story of Beder, Prince of Persia, and Jehanara, Princess of Samandal, or Samander Part 2 
as soon as the king of persia was in the closet queen gulnar ordered one of her women to bring her a fire-pan with a little fire after that she bade her retire and shut the door when she was alone she took a piece of aloes wood out of a box and put it into the fire-pan as soon as she saw the smoke rise she repeated some words unknown to the king of persia who observed with great attention all that she did she had no sooner ended than the sea began to be disturbed the closet the king was in was so contrived that looking through the lattice on the same side with the windows that faced the sea he could plainly perceive it at length the sea opened at some distance and presently there arose out of it a tall handsome young man with whiskers of a sea-green colour a little behind him a lady advanced in years but of a majestic air attended by five young ladies nothing inferior in beauty to the queen gulnar queen gulnar immediately came to one of the windows and saw the king her brother the queen her mother and the rest of her relations who at the same time perceived her also the company advanced supported as it were upon the waves when they came to the edge they nimbly one after another sprung in at the window king salah the queen her mother and the rest of her relations embraced her tenderly on their first entrance with tears in their eyes after queen gulnar had received them with all imaginable honour and made them sit down upon a sofa the queen her mother addressed herself to her daughter said she i am overjoyed to see you again after so long an absence and i am confident that your brother and your relations are no less so your leaving us without acquainting any one with your intention involved us in inexpressible concern and it is impossible to tell you how many tears we have shed on your account we know of no reason that could induce you to take such a resolution but what your brother related to us respecting the conversation that passed between him and you the advice he gave you seemed to him at that time advantageous for settling you in the world and suitable to the then posture of our affairs if you had not approved of his proposal you ought not to have been so much alarmed and give me leave to tell you you took his advice in a different light from what you ought to have done. But no more of this. It serves only to renew the occasion of our sorrow and complaint, which we and you ought to bury forever in oblivion. Give us now an account of all that has happened to you since we saw you last, and of your present situation. But especially, let us know if you are married. Gulnar immediately threw herself at her mother's feet, and kissing her hand, Madam, said she, I own I have been guilty of a fault, and I am indebted to your goodness for the pardon which you are pleased to grant me. What I am going to say, in obedience to your commands, will soon convince you that it is often in vain for us to have an aversion for certain measures. I have myself experienced that the only thing I had an abhorrence to is that to which my destiny has led me. She then related the whole of what had befallen her since she quitted the sea for the earth. As soon as she had concluded, and acquainted them with her having been sold to the king of Persia, in whose palace she was at present, Sister, said the king her brother, you have been wrong to suffer so many indignities, but you can properly blame nobody but yourself. You have it in your power now to free yourself and I cannot but admire your patience, that you could endure so long a slavery. Rise, and return with us into my kingdom, which I have reconquered from the proud usurper who had made himself master of it. The king of Persia, who heard these words from the closet where he stood, was in the utmost alarm. Ah, oh, he said to himself, I am ruined, and if my queen, my gulnar, hearken to this advice and leave me i shall surely die for it is impossible for me to live without her queen gulnar soon put him out of his fears brother said she smiling what i have just heard gives me a greater proof than ever of the sincerity of your affection 
I could not brook your proposing to me a match with a prince of the earth. Now I can scarcely forbear being angry with you for advising me to break the engagement I have made with the most puissant and most renowned monarch in the world. I do not speak here of an engagement between a slave and her master. It would be easy to return the ten thousand pieces of gold he gave for me. But I speak now of a contract between a wife and a husband and a wife who has not the least reason to complain. He is a religious, wise, and temperate king, and has given me the most essential demonstrations of his love. What can be a greater proof of the sincerity of his passion than sending away all his women, of which he had a great number, immediately upon my arrival, and confining himself to me alone? I am now his wife, and he has lately declared me Queen of Persia, to share with him in his counsels. Besides, I am pregnant, and if heaven permit me to give him a son, that will be another motive to engage my affections to him the more. So that, brother, continued the Queen Gulnar, instead of following your advice, you see I have all the reason in the world not only to love the King of Persia as passionately as he loves me, but also to live and die with him, more out of gratitude than duty. I hope, then, neither my mother nor you, nor any of my cousins, will disapprove of the resolution or the alliance I have made, which will do equal honour to the kings of the sea and earth. Excuse me for giving you the trouble of coming hither from the bottom of the deep to communicate it to you, and to enjoy the pleasure of seeing you after so long a separation. "'Sister,' replied King Salah, "'the proposal I made you of going back with us into my kingdom, upon the recital of your adventures, which I could not hear without concern, was only to let you see how much we all love you, and how much I, in particular, honour you, and that nothing is so dear to me as your happiness. Upon the same account, then, for my own part, I cannot condemn a resolution so reasonable and so worthy of yourself, after what you have told us of the King of Persia, your husband, and the great obligations you owe him, and I am persuaded that the Queen, our mother, will be of the same opinion. The Queen confirmed what her son had spoken, and addressing herself to Gulnar, said, I am glad to hear you are pleased, and I have nothing to add to what your brother has said. I should have been the first to condemn you, had you not expressed all the gratitude you owe to a monarch that loves you so passionately. As the king of Persia had been extremely concerned under the apprehension of losing his beloved queen, so now he was transported with joy at her resolution never to forsake him, and having no room to doubt of her love after so open a declaration, he resolved to evince his gratitude in every possible way. While the king was indulging incredible pleasure, Queen Gulnar clapped her hands, and immediately some of her slaves entered, whom she had ordered to bring in a collation. As soon as it was served up, she invited the queen her mother, the king her brother, and her cousins to partake. They began to reflect that they were in the palace of a mighty king, who had never seen or heard of them, and that it would be rudeness to eat at his table without him. This reflection raised a blush in their faces, and in their emotion, their eyes glowing like fire, they breathed flames at their mouths and nostrils. This unexpected sight put the king of Persia, who was totally ignorant of the cause of it, into a dreadful consternation. Queen Gulnar, suspecting this, and understanding the intention of her relations, rose from her seat, and told them she would be back in a moment. She went directly to the closet, and by her presence recovered the king of Persia from his surprise. Sir, said she, I doubt not but that your majesty is well pleased with the acknowledgement I have made of the many favours for which I am indebted to you. I might have complied with the wishes of my relations, and gone back with them into their dominions, but I am not capable of such ingratitude for which I should have been the first to condemn myself. Ah, my queen, cried the king of Persia, speak no more of your obligations to me. You have none. I am under so many to you, 
that I shall never be able to repay them. I never thought it possible you could have loved me so tenderly as you do, and as you have made appear to me in the most endearing manner. Ah, sir, replied Gulnar, could I do less? I fear I have not done enough, considering all the honours that your majesty has heaped upon me, and it is impossible for me to remain insensible of your love after so many convincing proofs as you have given me. But, sir, continued Gulnar, let us drop this subject, and give me leave to assure you of the sincere friendship the queen my mother and the king my brother are pleased to honour you with. They earnestly desire to see you, and tell you so themselves. I intended to have had some conversation with them by ordering a banquet for them, before I introduced them to your majesty. But they are impatient to pay their respects to you, and therefore I beseech your majesty to be pleased to honour them with your presence. Madam, said the king of Persia, I should be glad to salute persons who have the honour to be so nearly related to you, but I am afraid of the flames they breathe at their mouths and nostrils. Sir, replied the queen laughing, you need not in the least fear those flames, which are nothing but a sign of their unwillingness to eat in your palace without your honouring them with your presence and eating with them. The king of Persia, encouraged by these words, rose and went into the apartment with his queen Gulnar. She presented him to the queen her mother, to the king her brother, and to her other relations, who instantly threw themselves at his feet, with their faces to the ground. The king of Persia ran to them, and lifting them up, embraced them one after another. After they were all seated, King Salah began. Sir, said he to the king of Persia, we are at a loss for words to express our joy, to think that the queen my sister, in her disgrace, should have the happiness of falling under the protection of so powerful a monarch. We can assure you she is not unworthy of the high rank to which you have been pleased to raise her and we have always had so much love and tenderness for her, that we could never think of parting with her to any of the puissant princes of the sea, who have often demanded her in marriage before she came of age. Heaven has reserved her for you, and we have no better way of testifying our gratitude for the favour it has done her, than beseeching it to grant your majesty a long and happy life with her, and to crown you with prosperity and satisfaction. Certainly replied the king of Persia, heaven reserved her for me, as you observe. I love her with so tender and ardent a passion, that I am satisfied I never loved any woman till I saw her. I cannot sufficiently thank either the queen, her mother, or you, prince, or your whole family, for the generosity with which you have consented to receive me into an alliance so glorious to me as yours. So saying, he invited them to take part of the collation, and he and his queen sat down with them. After the collation, the king of Persia conversed with them till it was very late, and when they thought it convenient to retire, he waited upon them himself to the several apartments he had ordered to be prepared for them. The king of Persia treated his illustrious guests with continual feasts, in which he omitted nothing that might show his grandeur and magnificence, and insensibly prevailed with them to stay with him till the queen was brought to bed. When the time of her lying in drew near, he gave particular orders that nothing should be wanting proper for such an occasion. At length she was brought to bed of a son, to the great joy of the queen her mother, who assisted at the labour and presented him to the king. The king of Persia received this present with a joy easier to be imagined than expressed. The young prince, being of a beautiful countenance, he thought no name so proper for him as that of Beder, which in the Arabian language signifies the full moon. To return thanks to heaven, he was very liberal in his alms to the poor, caused the prison doors to be set open, and gave all his slaves of both sexes their liberty. He distributed vast sums among the ministers and holy men of his religion. He also gave large donations to his courtiers, besides a considerable sum that was thrown amongst the people, and by proclamation ordered rejoicings to be kept for several days through the whole city. 
One day, after the queen was recovered, as the king of Persia, Gulnar, the queen her mother, King Salah her brother, and the princesses their relations, were discoursing together in her majesty's bedchamber, the nurse came in with the young prince Beder in her arms. King Salah, as soon as he saw him, ran to embrace him, and taking him in his arms, kissed and caressed him with the greatest demonstrations of tenderness. He took several turns with him about the room, dancing and tossing him about, when all of a sudden, through a transport of joy, the window being open, he sprung out and plunged with him into the sea. The king of Persia, who expected no such sight, believing he should either see the prince his son no more, or else that he should see him drowned, was overwhelmed in affliction. Sir, said Queen Gulnar, with a quiet and undisturbed countenance, the better to comfort him. Let your majesty fear nothing. The young prince is my son as well as yours, and I do not love him less than yourself. You see, I am not alarmed, neither in truth ought I to be. He runs no risk, and you will soon see the king his uncle appear with him again, and bring him back safe. Although he be born of your blood, he is equally of mine and will have the same advantage his uncle and I possess, of living equally in the sea and upon the land. The queen his mother and the princesses his relations affirmed the same thing, yet all they said had no effect on the king, who could not recover from his alarm till he again saw Prince Beder. The sea at length became troubled, when immediately King Salah arose with the young prince in his arms, and holding him up in the air, re-entered at the window from which he had leaped. The king of Persia, being overjoyed to see Prince Beder again, and astonished that he was as calm as before he lost sight of him, King Salah said, Sir, was not your majesty in alarm when you first saw me plunge into the sea with the prince, my nephew? Alas, prince, answered the king of Persia, I cannot express my concern. I thought him lost from that very moment, and you now restore life to me by bringing him again. I thought as much, replied King Salah, though you had not the least reason to apprehend danger, for before I plunged into the sea I pronounced over him certain mysterious words, which were engraved on the seal of the great Solomon, the son of David. We practice the like in relation to all those children that are born in the regions at the bottom of the sea, by virtue whereof they receive the same privileges as we have, over those people who inhabit the earth. From what your majesty has observed, you may easily see what advantage your son Prince Beder has acquired by his birth on the part of his mother, Gulnar, my sister. For as long as he lives, and as often as he pleases, he will be at liberty to plunge into the sea, and traverse the vast empire it contains in its bosom. Having so spoken, King Salah, who had restored Prince Beder to his nurse's arms, opened a box he had fetched from his palace in the little time he had disappeared, which was filled with three hundred diamonds, as large as pigeons' eggs, a like number of rubies of extraordinary size, as many emerald ones, each half a foot long, and thirty strings or necklaces of pearls, consisting each of ten feet. Sir, said he to the king of Persia, presenting him with this box, when I was first summoned by the queen my sister, I knew not what part of the earth she was in, or that she had the honour to be married to so great a monarch. This made us come without a present. As we cannot express how much we have been obliged to your majesty, I beg you to accept this small token of gratitude, in acknowledgment of the many favours you have been pleased to show her, wherein we take equal interest. It is impossible to express how greatly the king of Persia was surprised at the sight of so much riches, enclosed in so little compass. "'What, prince?' cried he. "'Do you call so inestimable a present a small token of your gratitude, when you never have been indebted to me? I declare once more, you have never been in the least obliged to me, neither the queen your mother nor you. I esteem myself but too happy in the consent you have given to the alliance I have contracted with you, madam.' said he, turning to Gulnar. The king, your brother, has put me into the greatest confusion, and I would beg of him to permit me to refuse his present, were I not afraid of disobliging him. 
do you therefore endeavour to obtain his leave that i may be excused accepting it sir replied king salah i am not at all surprised that your majesty thinks this present so extraordinary i know you are not accustomed upon earth to see precious stones of this quality and number but if you knew as i do the mines whence these jewels were taken and that it is in my power to form a treasure greater than those of all the kings of the earth you would wonder we should have the boldness to make you so small a present i beseech you therefore not to regard its trifling value but consider the sincere friendship which obliges us to offer it to you and not give us the mortification of refusing it these engaging expressions obliged the king of persia to accept the present for which he returned many thanks both to king salah and the queen his mother a few days after king salah gave the king of persia to understand that the queen his mother the princesses his relations and himself could have no greater pleasure than to spend their whole lives at his court but that having been so long absent from their own kingdom where their presence was absolutely necessary they begged of him to excuse them if they took leave of him and queen gulnar the king of persia assured them he was sorry it was not in his power to return their visit in their own dominions but added as i am persuaded you will not forget gulnar i hope i shall have the honour to see you again more than once many tears were shed on both sides upon their separation king salah departed first but the queen his mother and the princesses his relations were obliged to force themselves from the embraces of gulnar who could not prevail with herself to let them go this royal company were no sooner out of sight than the king of persia said to gulnar madam i should have looked upon the person who had pretended to pass those upon me for true wonders of which i myself have been eye-witness from the time i have been honoured with your illustrious family at my court as one who would have abused my credulity but i cannot refuse to believe my senses and shall remember them while i live and never cease to bless heaven for directing you to me in preference to any other prince Beder was brought up and educated in the palace under the care of the king and queen of persia who both saw him grow and increase in beauty to their great satisfaction he gave them yet greater pleasure as he advanced in years by his continual sprightliness his agreeable manners and the justness and vivacity of his wit and this satisfaction was the more sensible because king salah his uncle the queen his grandmother and the princesses his relations came from time to time to partake of it he was easily taught to read and write and was instructed with the same facility in all the sciences that became a prince of his rank when he arrived at the age of fifteen he acquitted himself in all his exercises with infinitely better address and grace than his masters he was withal wise and prudent the king who had almost from his cradle discovered in him virtues so necessary for a monarch and who moreover began to perceive the infirmities of old age coming upon himself every day would not stay till death gave him possession of his throne but proposed to resign it to him he had no great difficulty to make his council consent to this arrangement and the people heard his resolution with so much the more joy as they conceived prince beder worthy to govern them in a word as the king had not for a long time appeared in public they had the opportunity of observing that he had not that disdainful proud and distant air which most princes have who look upon all below them with scorn and contempt they saw on the contrary that he treated all mankind with that goodness which invited them to approach him that he heard favourably all who had anything to say to him that he answered everybody with a goodness that was peculiar to him and that he refused nobody anything that had the least appearance of justice the day for the ceremony was appointed when in the midst of the whole assembly which was then more numerous than ordinary the king of persia came down from his throne took the crown from his head put it on that of prince beder and having seated him in his place kissed his hand 
as a token that he resigned his authority to him after which he took his place among the crowd of viziers and emirs below the throne hereupon the viziers emirs and other principal officers came immediately and threw themselves at the new king's feet taking each the oath of fidelity according to their rank then the grand vizier made a report of diverse important matters on which the young king gave judgment with that admirable prudence and sagacity that surprised all the council he next turned out several governors convicted of maladministration and put others in their room with such wonderful and just discernment as exalted the acclamations of everybody which were so much the more honourable as flattery had no share in them he at length left the council accompanied by his father and went to wait on his mother queen gulnar at her apartment the queen no sooner saw him coming with his crown upon his head than she ran to him and embraced him with tenderness wishing him a long and prosperous reign the first year of his reign king beder acquitted himself of all his royal functions with great assiduity above all he took care to inform himself of the state of his affairs and all that might any way contribute towards the happiness of his people next year having left the administration to his council under the direction of his father he left his capital under pretence of diverting himself with hunting but his real intention was to visit all the provinces of his kingdom that he might reform abuses establish good order and deprive all ill-minded princes his neighbours of any opportunities of attempting anything against the security and tranquillity of his subjects by showing himself on his frontiers it required no less than a whole year for the young monarch to execute a design so worthy of him soon after his return the old king his father fell so dangerously ill that he knew at once he should never recover he waited for his last moment with great tranquillity and his only care was to recommend to the ministers and other lords of his son's court to persevere in the fidelity they had sworn to him and there was not one but willingly renewed his oath as freely as at first he died at length to the great grief of king beder and queen gulnar who caused his corpse to be borne to a stately mausoleum worthy of his rank and dignity the funeral obsequies ended king beder found no difficulty to comply with that ancient custom in persia to mourn for the dead a whole month and not to be seen by anybody during that time he had mourned the death of his father his whole life had he yielded to his excessive affliction and had it been right for a great prince thus to abandon himself to sorrow during this interval the queen gulnar's mother and king saleh together with the princesses their relations arrived at the persian court to condole with their relations when the month was expired the king could not refuse admittance to the grand vizier and the other lords of his court who besought him to lay aside his mourning to show himself to his subjects and take upon him the administration of affairs as before he showed so much reluctance to comply with their request that the grand vizier was forced to take upon himself to say sir it were needless to represent to your majesty that it belongs only to women to persist in perpetual mourning we doubt not but you are fully convinced of this and that it is not your intention to follow their example neither our tears nor yours are capable of restoring life to the good king your father though we should lament him all our days he has submitted to the common law of all men which subjects them to pay the indispensable tribute of death yet we cannot say absolutely that he is dead since we see in him your sacred person he did not himself doubt when he was dying but he should revive in you and to your majesty it belongs to show that he was not deceived king beder could no longer oppose such pressing instances he laid aside his mourning and after he had resumed the royal habit and ornaments began to provide for the necessities of his kingdom and subjects with the same assiduity as before his father's death he acquitted himself with universal approbation 
and as he was exact in maintaining the ordinances of his predecessor, the people did not perceive they had changed their sovereign. King Salah, who was returned to his dominions in the sea with the queen his mother and the princesses, no sooner saw that King Beder had resumed the government, but he, at the end of the year, came alone to visit him, and King Beder and Queen Gilnar were overjoyed to see him. One evening, talking of various matters, King Salah fell insensibly on the praises of the king his nephew, and expressed to the queen his sister how glad he was to see him govern so prudently, as to acquire such high reputation, not only among his neighbours, but more remote princes. King Beder, who could not bear to hear himself so well spoken of, and not being willing, through good manners, to interrupt the king his uncle, turned on one side, and feigned to be asleep, leaning his head against a cushion that was behind him. From these commendations, which regarded only the conduct and genius of Beder, King Salah came to speak of the perfections of his person, which he extolled as prodigies, having nothing equal to them upon earth, or in all the kingdoms under the waters with which he was acquainted. Sister, said he, I wonder you have not thought of marrying him. If I mistake not, he is in his twentieth year, and at that age no prince ought to be suffered to be without a wife. I will think of a match for him myself, since you will not, and marry him to some princess of our lower world that may be worthy of him. Brother, replied Queen Gilnar, you call to my attention what I must own has never occurred to me. As he discovered no inclination for marriage, I never thought of mentioning it to him. I like your proposal of one of our princesses, and I desire you to name one so beautiful and accomplished that the king my son may be obliged to love her. I know one, replied King Salah softly, but before I tell you who she is, let us see if the king my nephew be asleep, and I will tell you afterwards why it is necessary we should take that precaution. Queen Gilnar turned about and looked at her son, and thought she had no reason to doubt but he was in a profound sleep. King Beder, nevertheless, far from sleeping, redoubled his attention, unwilling to lose anything the king his uncle said with so much secrecy. There is no necessity for your speaking so low, said the queen to the king her brother. You may speak out with freedom, without fear of being heard. It is by no means proper, said King Salah, that the king my nephew should as yet have any knowledge of what I am going to say. Love, you know, sometimes enters at the ear, and it is not necessary he should thus conceive a passion for the lady I am about to name. Indeed, I see many difficulties to be surmounted, not on the lady's part, as I hope, but on that of her father. I need only mention to you the Princess Jehaunara, daughter of the King of Samandal. How, brother, replied Queen Gilnar, is not the princess yet married? I remember to have seen her before I left your palace. She was then about eighteen months old, surprisingly beautiful, and must needs be the wonder of the world if her charms have increased with her years. The few years she is older than the king, my son, ought not to prevent us from doing our utmost to effect the match. Let me but know the difficulties in the way, and we will surmount them. Sister, replied King Salah, the greatest difficulty is that the king of Samandal is insupportably vain, looking upon all others as his inferiors. It is not likely we shall easily get him to enter into this alliance. I will, however, go to him in person, and demand of him the princess's daughter and in case he refuses her, we will address ourselves elsewhere, where we shall be more favourably heard. For this reason, as you may perceive, added he, it is as well for the king my nephew not to know anything of our design, till we have the consent of the king of Samandal. They discoursed a little longer upon this point, and before they parted, agreed that King Salah should forthwith return to his own dominions, and demand the princess for the king of Persia, his nephew. This done, Queen Gilnar and King Salah, who believed King Beder asleep, agreed to awake him before they retired, and he dissembled so well that he seemed to awake from a profound sleep. 
he had heard every word, and the character they gave of the princess had inflamed his heart with a new passion. He had conceived such an idea of her beauty, that the desire of possessing her made him pass the night very uneasy, without closing his eyes. The next day King Salah proposed taking leave of Gilnar, and the king his nephew. The young king, who knew his uncle would not have departed so soon, but to go and promote without loss of time his happiness, changed colour when he heard him mention his departure. His passion was become so violent, it would not suffer him to wait so long for the sight of his mistress, as would be required to accomplish the marriage. He more than once resolved to desire his uncle to bring her away with him, but as he did not wish to let the queen his mother understand he knew anything of what had passed, he desired him only to stay with him one day more, that they might hunt together, intending to take that opportunity to discover his mind to him. The day for hunting was fixed, and King Beder had many opportunities of being alone with his uncle, but he had not courage to acquaint him with his design. In the heat of the chase, when King Salah was separated from him, and not one of his officers or attendants was near him, he alighted by a rivulet, and having tied his horse to a tree, which with several others growing along the banks afforded a very pleasing shade, he laid himself on the grass, and gave free course to his tears, which flowed in great abundance, accompanied with many sighs. He remained a good while in this condition, absorbed in thought, without speaking a word. King Salah, in the meantime, missing the king his nephew, began to be much concerned to know what was become of him, but could meet no one who could give any tidings of him. He therefore left his company to seek for him, and at length perceived him at a distance. He had observed the day before, and more plainly that day, that he was not so lively as he used to be, and that, if he was asked a question, he either answered not at all, or nothing to the purpose, but never in the least suspected the cause. As soon as he saw him lying in that disconsolate posture, he immediately guessed he had not only heard what had passed between him and Queen Gulnar, but was become passionately in love. He alighted at some distance from him, and having tied his horse to a tree, came upon him so softly that he heard him pronounce the following words. Amiable princess of the kingdom of Samandal, I have no doubt had but an imperfect sketch of your incomparable beauty. I hold you to be still more beautiful, in preference to all the princesses of the world, and to excel them as much as the sun does the moon and stars. I would this moment go and offer you my heart, if I knew where to find you. It belongs to you, and no princess shall be possessor of it but yourself. King Salah would hear no more. He advanced immediately, and discovered himself to Beder. "'From what I see, nephew,' said he, "'you heard what the queen your mother and I said the other day of the princess Jehonara. It was not our intention you should have known anything respecting her, and we thought you were asleep.' "'My dear uncle,' replied King Beder, "'I heard every word, and have sufficiently experienced the effect you foretold.' which it was not in your power to prevent. I detained you on purpose to acquaint you with my love before your departure, but the shame of disclosing my weakness, if it be any, to love a princess so worthy of my affection, sealed up my mouth. I beseech you then, by the friendship you profess for a prince who has the honour to be so nearly allied to you, that you would pity me, and not wait to procure me the consent of the divine Jehonara till you have gained that of the king of Samandal, that I may marry his daughter, unless you had rather see me die with love before I behold her. These words of the king of Persia greatly embarrassed King Salah. He represented to him how difficult it was to give him the satisfaction he desired, and that he could not do it without carrying him along with him, which might be of dangerous consequence since his presence was so absolutely necessary in his kingdom. He conjured him, therefore, to moderate his passion, till such time as he had put things into a train to satisfy him, assuring him he would use his utmost diligence, and would come to acquaint him in a few days. 
but these reasons were not sufficient to satisfy the king of Persia. "'Cruel uncle,' said he, "'I find you do not love me so much as you pretended, and that you had rather see me die than grant the first request I ever made.' "'I am ready to convince your majesty,' replied King Salah, "'that I would do anything to serve you. "'But as for carrying you along with me, "'I cannot do that till I have spoken to the queen your mother. "'What would she say of you and me? "'If she consents, I am ready to do all you would have me, "'and will join my entreaties to yours.' "'You cannot be ignorant,' replied the king of Persia, "'that the queen my mother would never willingly part with me.' and therefore this excuse does but farther convince me of your unkindness. If you really love me, as you would have me believe, you must return to your kingdom immediately, and take me with you. King Salah, finding himself obliged to yield to his nephew's importunity, drew from his finger a ring on which were engraved the same mysterious names of God that were upon Solomon's seal, which had wrought so many wonders by their virtue. Here, take this ring, said he, put it on your finger, and fear neither the waters of the sea nor their depth. The king of Persia took the ring, and when he had put it on his finger, King Salah said to him, Do as I do. At the same time they both mounted lightly up into the air, and made towards the sea, which was not far distant, and they both plunged into it. End of section 2